Mr. Noel for the net on Radio 1. Which of your three awards is most important to you? None of them. They're all voted for by idiots and ponytails with what dicky bows on. the one voted by fans, though? Uh, the one voted for by the fans means a lot. Anything that's voted for by fans is, is special. Anything that's voted for by idiots, corporate pigs, means nothing to us. In 1995, a band fronted by two squabbling brothers from Burnage unleashed a record which would come to define the entire decade. While only their second album, What's the Story Morning Glory transformed indie rockers Oasis into the biggest band in Britain. They embraced the culture, which is our culture, which was pop music from the 60s and the 70s, and they brought it to a fore, which was like working class lads from Manchester, from Burnage, you know, to do this, you know, make this music, and it was real, it was real, it was street music, which was really important, it was as real as hip hop is. There's always one album, isn't there, that they sort of, 30 years on, the kids will be kind of going back to to find out what their parents were listening to. There is an entire generation literally an entire generation of British people who could probably hum every track off that record and whether you like the record or not that does have that impact on somebody on a, on a collective memory is really really important. This film is a review of that album. The music the band made and the world conquering rock and roll stars who made it. Prior to releasing What's the Story, Oasis had already established themselves within the independent rock circuit, as well as achieving a remarkable degree of success with their hugely acclaimed 1994 debut, Definitely Maybe. Oasis has just been one of them bands, and it's like every week it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, so... Um, it was pretty obvious from the start that something special was happening, you know what I mean? Not, not particularly big, not solely because of the music they were making, but because of the lifestyle they were representing. Um, they were just some, they just tapped a nerve more so than any other band in the last 30 years have tapped. More, more than the Sex Pistols even, you know what I mean? Sex Pistols appealed to like a little minority of the population uh, and I was one of them at the time, but Oasis just like tapped into millions and millions and millions of people's uh, tastes and attitudes. I think Oasis just wanted to be the Stone Roses. They loved the Stone Roses, they absolutely adored the Stone Roses. Ian Brown in particular, for Liam. And I think that that's what they wanted to do because when they were making Morning Glory, Stone Roses were labouring over their second album. So you guys are originally from Manchester then, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why you mentioned the Stone Roses, right? Well, to me they were always the greatest band in England, but now they're the second greatest band in England. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you being the first? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the general vibe was Manchester is over. All the music press would say, Manchester's over. Nobody's going to come from Manchester ever again. You've had it, you've played all your cars now. You've had the Roses, you've had the Mondays. Nothing's going to come through, which I think is a pretty stupid thing to say because you never know, know what's going to come out of the city. There are no rules in pop music. Noel came to a lot of our gigs in the early days. And when he heard that he needed a new singer, he, he put his name forward to audition. Which I remember at the time thinking it was quite funny because he just he didn't look like a front man, you know what I mean? He's like this little scally from Burnage. But yeah, we tried him out, we'd give him an audition and um he could sing. I mean he, he, he was a songwriter, he had songs that he was writing in his bedroom and stuff. But uh it, it just wasn't the, the sort of he didn't have the vocal style that we needed. But we really liked him, you know, because we knew him a little bit through being a fan and after this audition, you know, we kept in touch and basically just said to him, come and be a roadie if you want. Because we had no employees at the time, we had nobody working for us. None of us realised that we were looking at probably one of the most important songwriters, uh, you know, of Britain in our, our lifetime, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I never, I never looked at him and thought, what a genius he is, you know what I mean? I always thought what a cool geezer is, what a top bloke, but never, never thought he was a musical genius or anything like that. I saw him first at Kentish Town, I saw him at the Forum. And then they played the story. They played then on the Tuesday and the story on the Thursday. And after he's had this party, and I got introduced to Noel, and he knew me because I'd, I'd been on the NME and I'd written about the jam. And so from then, from '94 onwards, you know, to see this kind of it was a phenomenon, an absolute phenomenon. Oasis supported Dodgy, um, Manchester University, before they had released anything. Um, <laughs> and there was no difference between them then than there is now. They, I remember spending a lot of time with uh, Leo and sitting down chatting with him, and he was like, you know, 
There's only two bands in Manchester, The Roses and Oasis, and I was like, this is a guy that's not even got a record deal yet, you know, and he was that confident. And they were really good. They did the version of I Am The Walrus. So I've had about six songs, and it was great. I thought they were brilliant then. I thought they were really great. Definitely maybe had made a huge splash in the UK at a time when the idea of sort of an exciting British rock and roll band didn't sound terribly probable. I mean, this was coming straight out of the sort of uh, a period in which the alternative sector in Britain had been dominated by, um, you know, Seattle-based American grunge, and basically every band in Britain at that point was running around in kind of flannel shirts and stupid goatee beards and trying to sound like Soundgarden. And so Oasis sort of appeared in the middle of all this as a, with a really kind of fundamental subscription to all the, the great virtues of classic British rock and roll. All their influences were obviously British, the Beatles, Slade, the Kinks, uh, and people were just reminded, I think, of, oh yeah, we, we can actually do it here as well. It was the, the album that everybody had. Everyone had the Stone Roses album, and before that, everyone had had the Smiths albums. Um, and then everybody bought, definitely maybe, it was that, that album that kind of transcended the normal kind of indie, cool record-buying record fraternity and, uh, and moved out into just everybody, you know, everybody you knew, people who didn't like music uh, had that record. When Columbia came out, that was something so sort of primal in that. There was, that was such an amazing rock record. Um, and still, you listen to it now, and it's, and it's you know, it's, it's, it gives you chills, that record. I mean, it's just, you know, it's so huge. It's everything that's great about British rock music. And you follow that with the likes of Supersonic and Shaker Maker and the, and the, and the album Definitely Maybe. I mean, it, it was, you know, it was sensational. I remember being extremely excited about it. Rock music, hadn't seen a band like Oasis for years. I mean, you know, Oasis got me listening to rock music again because I didn't bother with it. It was just so tedious and boring. And then along comes this band and you've got these amazing songs and then you've got this front man who's so charismatic. And then you've got this, uh, the look, you know, they look like a gang. They all look like they'd, you know, catch a bullet for each other. So there'd, there'd been nothing like it, you know, and then that debut album arrived. You know, the sound was huge. It was a unique sound. Liam's vocals, you hadn't heard a singer like that before. The whole package was just, you know, unbelievable. It, was, it just came and everything just fell in front of them, you know. They looked great. They were terrific fun to write about. Their interviews were hilarious. So yeah, they, they were a... They were a phenomenon in the making, and I think the, the general perception was that the second album would be the one that, you know, cashed in on the promise. Quite how Oasis were going to develop remained something of a mystery. After the initial burst of their vibrantly fresh and confident sound, there were numerous expectations as to how this would be followed. The expectation was pretty great, um, and I suppose we were wondering what direction the songwriting would take because the, the debut album was all about we want to be rock and roll stars, we want to have fun, we want to get out of burnage and we want to be the biggest band in the world. Because that's what they, after Stone Roses, that's what new English bands were about. They were about we want to be the biggest and the best. That was the simplicity of the message. You know, with the Smiths, the, the message was I hate myself and I want to die, I want to go, I, you know, I hate being in public and, and having fun and discotheques make me feel nauseous, I am alienated, I'm a complex individual, I suffer. It was all about being, you know, uh, a tortured individual. Oasis was the diametric opposite of that, it was all about communal pleasure and just the simple things in life, cigarettes and alcohol, and tonight I'm a rock and roll star. Well, a lot of people do stand in front of the mirror with a tennis racket and mime along to songs. I used to do it when I was a kid. Mm. And for that, 
for the duration of that record you'd mime into, whether it being like uh, the Beatles or the Sex Pistols or whatever, you know, you are Johnny Rotten, you know, or you are John Lennon. I, I'm not really sure that anybody was really expecting a, a massive progression from Definitely Maybe. Uh, I don't think anyone was imagining that Oasis were going to come back from their studio in Wales with a Sgt Pepper for the 1990s. I think people realised that at heart Oasis were essentially a fairly, you know, meat and potatoes rock and roll band. They were a very good meat and potatoes rock and roll band, but that's, that's what they were. The first time I heard the album, like Morning Glory, I was uh, in the studio next door. I was in Mono Valley, which is next door to Rockfield, producing this band called Cable. Uh, we just finished the recording. We went to town for a, few, a couple of drinks. And then uh, on the way back, this taxi stopped. And we got the taxi. And we just sat there, go blah, 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 chatting away. And there's kind of this, this bloke with two girls in, in the seat in front of us. He's kind of slumped down a bit. And then um, we're chatting away. And he turns around and he goes, Fucking hell, it's John Rob. I go, oh, Christ, it's Liam, what are you doing here? I didn't know they're in the studio. And he goes, I'm, I'm, we're in Rockfield, we're just, we're just doing the album, you know, because when, when you're in the studio, you're just in your own little bubble, you don't even realise what's going on 500 yards up the road. And he says, come down, we're having a party. So we went down there, and then he got the tape out of the studio, of the album. So we were the first people to ever hear the album, which is a bit of a buzz, you know. And they put it on, they played it, and I was going, no, oh, this is pretty rocking, this. And he, he goes to the guy on cable, Liam, he goes, what do you think this album? He's, he's dancing around and gets, Liam. He's, it's great, isn't it? And the player goes, it's crap, it sounds like the Beatles. And Liam goes, all right, fair play, you don't like it. And Liam's quite level, you know, he's quite cool about it. And then, then he plays another track, and he goes, think of that, and he goes, well, it's even crapper, it sounds like the Beatles. And the bloke was pissed out his head. And then he starts prodding Liam with his finger like that. And, and Liam's going, right, you can see Liam getting rattled, and I think, oh, I'm just going to leave him to it. And then there's a massive crashing sound, and there's a, the fight kicks off, and they're having a fight in the other room. So I was dragging the guy from Cable away. I said, right, right, we're all going. Like, and Liam's got right, you're all got to go. And Noel goes, right, that's it. About four in the morning, got in a car and drove to London, split the band up. So like, for two weeks, Oasis are completely split up. And it's all the fault of this bloke out of Cable. It's all a bit of a laugh, really. But, the, but we still heard about eight of the tracks of the album. Second albums are really difficult to make because uh, with the first album, you've normally, it's, it's normally been songs that, that people in bands have been writing since they were at school. And then, you know, it, it might be, they, they might have had 10 years worth of songs to, to draw upon. And that all goes into the first album and it's all very young and exciting. Then they go off on tour and they, they become famous. And all of a sudden they've got to write a second album. And if you think about, um, you know, just bands like um, uh, The Jam or The Clash, in their second albums were, were generally considered to be really weak. It's the same with a lot of bands' second records that, um, you know, the, the, the story goes that the first record you get five years to write it and the second one you get about six months. So you can't expect them to come back with, with as equally strong songs. Um, and so I think they did pretty well on that record. I don't know what people expect from me. I, in fact, I couldn't be less interested, to be honest with you. You know, it's like I do it, I do it for me, first and foremost. I think once you start writing music for your audience, it's, it's a bit... Why would you want to do that? I, can't, I don't understand that, but if people like it and that's what they expected, then great. But I, you know, I don't, I don't say, oh, I wonder what all the people out there are going to think of my next record or the one after that. I'm shit about that. You know. Noel had kept on banging uh, on in interviews about the fact he had, um, you know, drawers uh, at home full of great songs that he could use to follow up. Definitely, maybe. And I think everybody was quite sort of sceptical about that. Um, but I suppose, I guess that proved to be the case. Regardless of the anticipation surrounding the release, it seemed that no one had any idea that Oasis was standing on the cusp of monumental success. The success of Morning Glory took us all by surprise. Um, even though Oasis were obviously getting that much more successful, that much, quick, that much more quickly than, than, than a lot of other bands did. I mean, you know, the likes of Blur, who obviously they had their big spat with, um, it took them two or three albums to get to that sort of level. Um, the, Oasis, the Oasis were at within the space of their first. Um, so it, w it was surprising. The, the singles were doing you know, progressively better. Those signs that they were going to be the big band of the, of the era were all in place. And, um, but even, even then, we, we, we were just fairly shocked by the, by the size of the, of the second record. We certainly found at the NME when What Story came out that um, they were a big band. They're a big band for us, certainly, a, a, a huge band in our world. But we, we 
hadn't quite cottoned on to how big they'd become in the real world, as it were, um, to the degree that when once the story came out, uh, it was it was a, had made a big splash. But then a year later, we were noticing it was still in the charts, and it was like still high up in the charts. And we and, and so we actually, I, I personally went down to to um, the Virgin Megastore just to ask people who were buying it, you know, why are they still buying it? So I think that at that point they were really making that leap into into the um, the, the, the mainstream, really. It sold. It sold nearly four million copies and counting in this country, which means as you sort of like walk down the street of any British city on any day, that you know one person in fifteen walking past you owns a copy of that record, which is a staggering uh, level of um, of influence to have. They became these massive international rock and roll superstars, and they had all sorts of people at the gigs, and they mixed with the rich and famous, and I don't think they ever changed. You don't get many people from Burnage achieving what they've achieved, do you really? You don't get many people from Manchester achieving that. It's pretty amazing stuff, really, what they've done. Really amazing. On October 2nd, 1995, little over a year after the emergence of Definitely Maybe, What's the Story Morning Glory hit the shelves. With Oasis all set to introduce themselves to a much larger fan base, the record began with the rather appropriately titled Hello. Hello is in every way an absolutely perfect opening track, uh, and it really does set the tone for that album because, I mean, if, if you kind of think of how it tells the Oasis story, definitely maybe is definitely maybe is the train robbery. It's the it, it, it's it's the grand ludicrous how about this chap scheme. What's the story? Morning Glory is the I can't believe we got away with it celebration. I think Hello flattered to deceive, or it it, uh, it made you think you were going to get something that different. It it was a, a little bit like a relic from the first album in a way. It was upbeat and it was foot stomping and it was anthemic and it was a bit like definitely maybe part two, I think. Oasis are good at sort of inane stompers, aren't they? You know what I mean? They're good at those. You know, it had that kind of Gary Glitter thing going on. So they're probably not too happy about that. This was kind of like the Gary Glitter one, you know, the, the, the glitter band kind of glam stomp. And, uh, and I think people thought, oh, OK, yeah, here we go. Is this going to be a bunch of uh, recycled riffs or is it going to be the greatest album? Um, and, I've, uh, you know, after that track, I'm, you know, I don't know, that, that track set people off thinking. It's them saying hello to their two million fans, isn't it? This, it's like everyone's got all the fans get the record. Got, got, I hope they haven't got all soft on us. I hope we've got dragged an orchestra out or got all weedy on us or something. And they put the, the album on. It's like poof, this massive wall of sound. You can imagine every bed sit, every every house, everybody in the country put that record on and go yes. They they they, they said another kick-ass album. Hello carried a direct lineage from the last album, most notably via the sound of every instrument turned up to their maximum volume, a technique known both as brick walling or sound walling, something which had been developed by producer Owen Morris. A band like Oasis kind of need everything to be turned up full. I mean, that, that, that kind of, that's what makes, makes their, their music sound so huge, I guess, sort of everything turned up to 11. I think what people kind of forget is they were very, very psychedelic band. If, if, you, if you listen to um, Definitely Maybe and What's the Story, I mean, there's a loads of feedback and that there's loads of weird kind of noises and there's really, there's some, the two guitar thing, some of that guitar is really, really distorted to the max. That you can, you know, it's really nasty. A real guitar player doesn't just plug in and put the uh, amp on to three out of ten. I mean, that, that's, that's pathetic doing that. You put it up to ten and you keep trying to turn it around, you know. So it's just got this boom, great empowering sound. It's like, 
That, oh, it's fantastic. The first time I heard that, I thought, wow, this, this is great. This is absolutely great. The sound overall on, on Well, it's a Story Morning Glory is really, really interesting because it, it does sound a lot different from Definitely Maybe, which did sound like a rock and roll band being recorded, but uh, yet there is a sense has been remarked upon often for Definitely Maybe that you know, just this idea that people have of this mixing desk with just everything shoved all the way up to the top, um, which I don't think was entirely accidental. I think there's a certain, there's always been a certain symmetry about the fact that Oasis appeared on Creation Records because it did tend to get overlooked a lot at the time, but because when people talked about Oasis's influence they correctly talked about the Beatles and Slade and the Kinks, but they missed a lot um, in terms of actually constructing the Oasis sound, the influence of quite obscure uh, previous creation bands like My Bloody Valentine and especially the House of Love, who really did trade in this enormous kind of backwash of electric guitar. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, that incredible magpie year of Noel Gallagher's picked up a few tricks from them as well. The bombastic introduction of Hello was followed up by one of the band's most infamous, yet widely derided singles, Roll With It. A lot of people criticise Roll With It, and it's not, it's not like looked on as one of the classics on the album. It's, it's actually a pretty good song. It's, 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 it's Oasis by Numbers, but Oasis, even though Oasis by Numbers is good. Roll With It is, is an absolutely terrible song. Um, truly atrocious. Um, it is status quo. I mean, it's totally, it, 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 there's, there's, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing else to say about it. I mean, it, you know, without actually wanting to rip off status quo, they have done exactly that. They've just done a status quo song. Noel Gallagher has famously described Roll With It as, uh, you know, in one word, appalling, and that's a little bit harsh. It, it's fairly mindless, but it, it's not without its appeal. I think the, there's quite the, the melody of the chorus is quite pretty. The guitars are there's a quite an interesting guitar part in there if you want to go looking for it. Um, it's harmless, I think, would be the the best way to characterise it. But I, I, I don't think it's what. Um, it, it, it's not going to be the title that Noel Gallagher wants chiselled on his tombstone. Roll With It also marked Oasis's entry into a now legendary chart battle, the heated contest for the number one slot with their supposed arch rivals, Blur. Everyone says this, but, you know, in the 60s you had the Stones versus the Beatles and in the early 70s you had T-Rex versus Slade apparently moving release dates to avoid each other so that there'd be no competition. And in the 80s you had Spandau versus Duran and this was just another version of that. And whether it was a contrived attempt to generate publicity or not doesn't matter because the effect was achieved and there, there was a great pop moment. The Manchester band Oasis and their arch rivals Blur released new singles today, each hoping to reach the number one spot next week. The music industry hasn't seen anything like it since the Beatles fought it out with the Rolling Stones in the 60s. Whenever anybody talks about the Oasis story, they'll talk about the Blur thing and the Oasis thing, which wasn't really about two bands, it was probably more about two record companies. And they both sold loads more singles as a result of that whole shenanigan. But if you had to asked me to choose between them, I'd always go for Oasis. Oasis made it very easy for the, easy for the media to pick up on and, and Blur also with that sort of rivalry. I'd like to thank um, all the people. All, all the people. people. So many people. And they walk up hands in hands, hands in hands through their shite life. You know, you know that if you met Oasis and Blur, you'd probably get on. I personally think I'd get on with Oasis better. That was always my thing. I mean, I'd, I've done gigs with Blur, and I've never met them. I've done gigs with Oasis and met them. Do you know what I mean? It's just simple. It's just like, just simple, and it's not a north-south thing. It's just like you know, working class thing. This is a radio moment. The uh... Probably the two largest bands in England right now, together yeah. in one radio studio. In one ring, man. That's right. I'm wearing the blue shards. And the Oasis. Are they coming in? Come on in. Wearing the white shards, bleh. That's right. That's right. Oasis in, in the red shorts. Stone. 
Eight stone three pounds. <laughs> bands were all overweight. Oh right. man, this is crazy. <laughs> Music's meant to kind of bring people together, really, not sort of uh, divide them up. Um, and um, so yeah, but they sold a hell of a lot of records because of it. And I think they both kind of, as bands, they, you know, they were all intelligent people and, and realised that this was um, going to just sort of do wonders for them because it was, it was turning what they were doing into the same kind of rivalries um, that the Beatles and the Stones had or the Jam and the Clash had. Roll with it, of course, became a bigger deal than it deserved to be because it was, it was the force Oasis deployed in their, their epic battle with Blur uh, in August 1995 when you know, the two bands went head to head by releasing singles on the same date. And there is, of course, the irony that in both cases, both bands released arguably the worst thing they'd ever recorded. Um, you know, Oasis with Roll With It, Blur with Country House. And as it was, of course, it can be said that while Blur won that particular battle, Oasis uh, eventually won the war. He's got morning glory and lots of different stories. I thought that kind of rivalry it was a shame because it kind of, you know, had all, all those those class divisions behind it. I think that, that Oasis was seen as a kind of the lads band, the sort of, you know, proletariat band, for want of a better word, and Blur were more the kind of art school, uh, indie kind of people. I think a lot of their popularity came from the fact that. Um, people could relate to them. They were just your mate being really cool on stage. Um, but that, once, the, once they got so huge, that kind of meant that, to a large degree, their audience became quite horrible. I mean, their audience, when you got to the likes of Nebworth or Finsbury Park, where I saw them uh, uh, about five or six years ago, became, you know, the, the football fan, drunk at two o'clock, vomiting on their shoes at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they became the sort of the lads, lads band. Um, which, I mean, you know, all, all very real in that, but doesn't make for that pleasant an experience, especially when you're, when you're in a, you know, 90,000-seater 90, 90, arena with them. See, more like, you always get these gigs where there'll be the front three rows of people in this big, massive hole, yeah. where there's just geezers running around, punching each other, yeah. doing, like, lift forever and stuff, and it's like... Like, yeah. Totally missing the point, so, you know. There is a certain element of people in the music press, especially at the Melody Maker at the time, which, which are quite snooty about bands that came from the north. You know, people, people say, oh, they just look like a bunch of plumbers, you know, and, and you know, they're just thick northerners. And I, I, I was at the Melody at the time, and you would hear people saying that, you know, certain people like that paper would have this kind of snobbish attitude, which I think is utterly ridiculous when you write about music, because it doesn't really matter. I don't care if, if Prince Charles makes a great record, it's a great record. I mean, he's not likely to, is he? But he might make, you know, it doesn't matter who the people are. If the record's great, let's have it, you know, and that's the thing about Oasis, it's proof that anybody you know, with a bit of application, can make a great record. Well, of course, you have to have a brilliant songwriter as well, which helps. For many, the Blur Oasis face-off marked the culmination of the Britpop movement, a cultural scene as distinctive as anything that had developed since the 1960s. The term Britpop was invented by jour a journalist. And the reason that journalists or, or newspapers love uh, movements is that it sells them papers. And especially if they're the first newspaper to be perceived to support that particular movement. So this lesson was learnt when punk happened. And the enemy went from 100,000 sales a week to 250, it's a quarter of a million, basically, because it was perceived as being the best and the most enthusiastic supporter of punk. And it's kind of offshoots like New Wave. But then if you look at the enemies from about 78 onwards and Melody Maker, everybody's scrambling for the new, you know, the new, the new thing. So therefore in 94, when the word Britpop was invented, um, it had this kind of, it had a lot of connotations which Oasis were associated with. It was like any kind of identifiable musical movement. At the heart of it, there were two or three really interestingly, interesting and enduringly great bands, and 
and Britpop did produce some fantastic records by Oasis, by Blur, by Pulp in particular, which really do stand up and which you can still imagine, you know, sane people wanting to listen to. But invariably, the, these are kind of pursued by an enormous throng of, you know, bandwagon jumpers, ambulance chasers, you know, chances and frauds. And there was a period at which Camden was just overrun by sort of, you know, idiots in skinny ties and stupid suits and funny haircuts. And if you're one of those people at that point and you could hold a guitar the right way up, then, yeah, you'd get signed the same way that you would have if you'd been in Seattle three years e earlier with a goatee beard and a checked shirt. Um, so, it, like any, any, any identifiable movement, once you kind of, like, sorted out the chaff, you know, yeah, there, there was some... Um, yeah, there was some exciting stuff at the heart of it, absolutely. You tend to find with pretty much every scene that as soon as a, a band or a record comes along that becomes absolutely huge and crosses over to, um, to the mass record buying public at large, that will tend to kill the scene, um, which is what we had with What's the Story. I mean, once you get those um, massive great records, suddenly all the record company wants is that record again, and they want new bands that sound like that. Um, so Britpop was, became this really dull um, scene, essentially, the, or what we call post-Britpop, I guess, um, once you hit sort of 95, 96, where it's all sort of, you know, stodgy um, bands with guitars who've got an acoustic segment in their shows, you know, doing this sort of arena-sized rock, uh, or supposedly alternative rock. Um, you know, you, you, there, was, there were so many bands, and those, those were the ones that the, the record companies were chasing, and, and those were the ones that the, the people who had bought What's the Story wanted. That, that's kind of a, a, an interesting theory that Oasis never got beyond Britpop, but um, I think they, they were very different, they were different bands. I think sort of Oasis were like some great big sort of oil tanker or something. I mean, they, to get them off their course was always going to be a kind of big effort. We're, we're blurred, we had a very turn, a quick turnover. Um, uh, uh, of ideas and styles, and Oasis kind of, it, it's that great thing that, that, that some great artists have, like, you know, Steve McQueen or Albert Finney or something. It's like, like they know what they're good at and, and they stick to it. Swiftly cementing itself as the sound of the era, it was the third song from What's the Story, also a single, that incredibly managed to make Oasis even bigger. Up until then, it'd been mainly rock and roll singles. You know, they'd been Live Forever and Supersonic and Shake and Make and Roll With It. And these were all up tempo, in your face, snarling, sneering, arrogant rock and roll. And then suddenly here was Wonderwall, and it was like the Christmas single, and you know, everybody just, you know, mums loved it, dads liked it, you know, the kids adored it. You can, you know, ask for more than that. That really broke Oasis. I remember when I first heard Wonderwall, and I'd just come back from uh, being away touring, and I heard it, and I thought, God, that sounds like a demo. It sounded like a demo. It was like acoustic, brushes, drums. But, you know, you can't mistake the appeal of the song. It's one of the great love songs. Um, I, th I think Noel has this ability of kind of writing these sort of lines that people can sing to each other, like couples can sort of sing to each other, which kind of say more than those two people could ever probably express themselves, and just, just in one line, you know. Uh, there are many things that I would like to say to you, but I don't know how. I mean, that's, that's, that's poetry. <laughs> Obviously, a great many people have an enormous soft spot for Wonderwall. Uh, I am not one of them. I think it's an absolutely atrocious song. I think it's, I, I think it's sappy, it's sentimental, it's mawkish, and it sounds like something that was written for sort of like drunk men in tracksuits to yell through their letterboxes at their wives who've thrown them out and with good reason. Wonderwall reminds me of when uh, alternative rock music really became everyone's property. So I feel sad about that. I'm also fed up of hearing it um, blaring out of pub jukeboxes. And it's, a, it's got too many associations with kind of um, 
chavvy um, council estate girls <laughs> on the raz. You know, it's just, it's got too many ugly uh, associations for me. It's, it can, it's not a private pleasure for me, that, that song. The tune is a non-event. I think Liam sings it incredibly badly. I think he's, he's a fantastic singer on sort of upbeat rock songs. He's a fantastic rock vocalist, but a lot of the time when he tries to do ballads, he doesn't have that kind of vulnerability or tremble that someone like Mick Jagger would have had on, say, something like Angie or Wild Horses. Um, and I think Liam honks his way through it um, fairly excruciatingly, I have to say. If I can sing it, he can sing it, apart from the quieter ones. Um, like some of the acoustic ones, he's got a very loud voice, so he couldn't really be able to sing sad songs and stuff like that. Uh, so I sing them, he's, but I don't write with him in mind at all. I just write. I think it's that he's got that ability to kind of express what ordinary people think and say. Sometimes sort of ordinary, you know, people don't like talking about their emotions unless they're drunk down the pub or whatever. And um, I think that's all. And, and, Liam's voice is a bit like that. It's all, it, everything's just slightly below the surface. All the emotion is slightly below the surface, which makes it really, really kind of, ni you know, nice to listen to. Liam's got, I mean, he's got an amazing voice, a, a great rock voice, and that sort of, that growl he puts on in, in the rock songs um, is, you know, it, it's, it's legendary now. It's, it's absolutely classic. But, um, but yeah, he can, it does tend to feel slightly bland in the ballads. I think Liam is the archetypal rock and roll star, isn't he? You know, that, that's, you know, brilliant. You know, just walking up to the microphone, this is me, these are my songs. You can't beat that, can you? Wonderwall quickly became part of the national psyche, leading many to ask the same question. Had Oasis achieved all this simply by being in the right place at the right time? You see, the thing is, people say that Oasis got lucky. Oh, they were in the right place at the right time. But you, you, you can't be in the right place at the right time and have the right stuff. They had everything, didn't they? You can't be that lucky. They were obviously, you know, of the moment, they were honest and real, and I think that's why people bought into them. They were, you know, the everyman. And so they came along with a big, stonky, great rock record, which was brilliant, and, uh, and they encapsulated a, a Britishness that wasn't otherwise being encapsulated. So I don't think it was the time, particularly. I don't think it was Britpop that helped them along. I think what they did is they came along with a brilliant record and just said, Britpop, yeah, we'll have that. Um, but I think that would have happened at any time, any time they'd come out with it. For any band to break the place open as spectacularly as Oasis did, a lot of it is just down to dumb luck, the planets lining up the right way, being the right band in the right place at the right time, and they absolutely were. Um, to an extent as well, you make your own luck. They put themselves there. Noel Gallagher, the man at the heart of Oasis, is a very canny human being and a very sharp operator, which isn't to say I think there was anything particularly contrived or cynical about what they were doing, but I think when Definitely Maybe became such a success, they did understand that, OK, we really can go the rest of the way here. Uh, and, and they did. Wonderwall's colossal sing-along status seemed almost unbeatable until Oasis released the final single from the album, track number four, Don't Look Back in Anger. I think Don't Look Back in Anger is a classic, absolute classic. Play it today, fantastic tune. Really, really um, beautiful. Wonderwall's OK, but I, Wonderwall was one of those songs which... It kind of, after a while, it, it, it just got too big. I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, it was just like you heard it all the time, and you can hear a record too much sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes, then you hear it one year late, you think, oh, actually, that's a really good tune, that, but, you know, it was... I, I much prefer Don't Look Back in Anger, I thought that was a fantastic tune. I think it's the strongest song on the album. It's, and Don't Look Back in Anger is everything you want from an Oasis song. It's, it's, it's quite... I mean, yes, it's a bit more strange, but it's still got that big anthemic feel that, um, that all the great Oasis songs have. Some of these really, really great big songs, even like Imagine, you know, there's a side of them where you think, well, it's kind of, is it, you know, overly simple? But I mean, it's, 
you know, it's not. It's very tender. And and Noel's voice, it, it, you know, Noel gets away with singing that. And and it's odd because I, I was thinking the other day about you know favourite um, Oasis songs. I thought ones that are particularly kind of moving. And I thought of, you know, look back in anger, and I thought of half a world away, and then talk tonight. And then there's um, a song on standing on the shoulder of giants, um, where did it all go wrong? And I suddenly thought, God, what have they all got in common? It's like, what they've all got in common is, is Noel sings them. So he obviously brought, I think he had a particular kind of, especially on the, on the more acoustic numbers and, and the kind of the, the slower, um, very Beatles-y melodic numbers, um, his work, his voice worked kind of really well, you know, in the way that Paul McCartney's did on, on those kind of songs with Beatles. I think it's kind of very interesting that he chose to sing those songs as well, because it obviously um, meant they were kind of, meant something um, very uh, uh, special to him. Well, I think it's quite telling that, um, that the best sounding ballad on the record is the one Noel sings. Don't Look Back in Anger, I think, actually works a little bit better for Noel quite wisely, having taken vocal duties off his younger brother for that one. Um, it's incredibly bombastic uh, and incredibly full of itself. Don't Look Back in Anger, I think, is one of the last truly brilliant songs that they, they did. That was probably the pinnacle of their uh, sort of uh, mass popularity, as far as, you know, if, if every band has one or two songs that go down in, in history. Despite its popularity, Don't Look Back in Anger gave many the notion that songwriter Noel Gallagher had plagiarised heavily from John Lennon's Imagine. This was, however, merely the latest in a string of similar accusations that had dogged Oasis since the beginning of their career. You know, having Imagine at the beginning of Don't Look Back in Anger, it's more of a reference than a rip-off. It doesn't actually make the song. It doesn't actually even fit in the song. In fact, I don't think there's actually much point in having it there at all because it doesn't, it doesn't really say much for the song. But on the other hand, it's a reference point to a song that they obviously really love. It's, I mean, to me, it's, it's the most hokey song John Lennon ever wrote. It's corny, isn't it? But to put it at the beginning of the song, it's, it's almost like a reference point to say, but, you know, they go like that to John Lennon, aren't they? You know, John Lennon used to fucking burn about and doing little mad things. And do you that know John Lennon? Do you know him? I don't, but do you? Yeah. Well, you must be pretty old. How old are you? 21? No. About fucking 1,005 fucking one. You're 22? No, I'm 21. Right, and remember, I watched you being born. Right then. And I don't even know John Lennon. Right then. Right then. So shut the fuck right up about right knowing right John Lennon. The, the number of headlines along the lines of the great tune robbery that Oasis have put up with over the years um, are not entirely unjustified. By the time Morning Glory came out, he'd already been sued successfully by Neil Innes um, over whatever, which he thought was too close to his booth song, How Sweet to Be an Idiot. How sweet. The ironies that piled up there, given that Neil Innes was most successful for making a, the film The Ruttles about a spoof version of the Beatles, then suing Noel Gallagher, who a lot of people thought was essentially, you know, running his own spoof version of the Beatles by that point. And Noel Gallagher had also been sued by the New Seekers because the chorus of Shaker Maker was a complete steal from I'd, I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing, and a song called Step Up was going to be on. Uh, What's a Story Morning Glory, but was pulled because Stevie Wonder's publishers wanted too much money for it because the melody was lifted um, wholesale from Uptight, uh, which you have to say was a fairly pyrrhic victory for Stevie Wonder's publishers because if I'd written the melody that Noel Gallagher wanted to steal and put on a record that was going to sell 18 million copies, then he's welcome. All rock and roll music is derivative, and the accusation that gets levelled at Oasis is that they just Beatles copy it. They all music is like that. You know, you can hear influences, and it's, 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 a, it's homage, isn't it, in the end? To plagiarise something I'm not really a massive fan, on, uh, fan of. I think rock music can move on. I think 
There are, we're in 2006 now, and I think there are a few rock bands that have taken it a bit further. Noel Gallagher has always been absolutely shamed, unash unashamed about his borrowing of uh, old rock records. He just, he almost, you know, he just goes like that, he flaunts it, he, you know, he does that with, with people that, that might even dare to suggest that you can't do that. Well, you can, and he has, and he will again. Has Noel Gallagher ever nicked anything musically from us? Um, I don't know, I mean, he's probably borrowed bits, you know what I mean, but... And I don't expect he's going to give them back. <laughs> no, he's only as guilty of plagiarism as any of us are, you know what I mean? That's, that's what it's all about, really, isn't it? Taking other people's ideas and reshaping them a bit. The success of Wonderwall and Don't Look Back in Anger inevitably meant that they overshadowed some of the other songs on the record, such as the track that follows them, Hey Now. Hey Now is largely unremembered with good reason. I mean, it, it, it sounded pretty rocking live, but in the context of the album, it's, it is an absolute filler, and actually what it also is, uh, as it turned out, was rather a harbinger of what much of the rest of Oasis's career would sound like. It basically, it sounds like Oasis, but not as good. Obviously, they had some tracks on it, like Hey Now, hey now which um, are kind of less memorable. Um, which you can't say about definitely maybe, um, to be honest with you. I mean, all, all classic albums, including Pet Sounds, uh, you know, Sgt Pepper, they've all got their one or two duff tracks. And What's the Story's got its fair share of duff tracks. But I think the three or four obvious standout tracks give the sense in a, more than it deserves that this is a great unified concept of an album. With a, a record like What's the Story, Morning Glory, it's almost impossible to have anything on there that's underrated because a record that big has been torn to pieces and, and appreciated over and over again. And, and, um, and so I don't think there's any, any tracks on that that you could call underrated. If you're the next track after, after Don't Look Back in Anger, you are going to get forgotten, you know, there's it's no way around it. But they're really good songs and also, also they make the album really work because you've heard the single so many times, it's actually great to hear uh, uh, something with a slightly different twist to it. You think, oh God, I forgot about this one, this is really good. Another lesser remembered aspect of the album are the instrumental moments. Quick musical snapshots that occasionally emerge between tracks. They were prey to um, artistic pretensions and I think that's what's going on there. That's a sort of attempt to try and sound... A, I, I think it's the kind of thing they thought that's the sort of thing the Beatles might have done. So let's do that. I think he got that idea from Weller. Because Paul used to do that on his solo albums like on uh, the first two especially. Quite what purpose or point those things are supposed to serve, I have absolutely no idea. They don't do any harm, but it's, um, it's a curiously pretentious quirk from such an avowedly sort of uh, no-nonsense rock and roll band. One of these musical snippets was taken from their B-side, The Swamp Song, a knowing nod, perhaps, to the sheer quality of the additional tracks that Noel Gallagher was including on the band's single releases. I think that was kind of almost unique in the 90s with Oasis, that they, uh, um, that they, they put at songs that could be A-sides or brilliant album tracks on B-sides. At this point in time, the, the, this is a band completely in its pomp. The, 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 Noel, Noel could have B-sides, which, which are far better than most songs any band ever writes in its career. It's just like they're just chucked away in a B-side, you know, and, and a lot of the B-sides that acquiesce are, are absolute classic songs, you know, that... They're like some of the best songs in the Oasis Canyon. It's, it's crazy to believe that was never an A-side song. It's, you know, that, that's one of the songs that absolutely takes the stadium apart when you see them play it live. Well, Oasis is one of those bands that their fans will, will, will soak up absolutely everything they put out. So B-sides were very, very important to, to the fans buying the records. Um, so I don't think there's any surprise that when they played the likes of Acquiesce Live, the, the place goes crazy. By this time I was hanging out with Noel a lot, because me and him got on really well, because we had football music, Catholicism, and council houses in, in sort of common, you know. And, um, you know, he'd play me, 
you know, some song and he'd go, oh yeah, but I'm saving that for the fourth album. He was just on it all the time. He was just, you know, you know, you'd go to a sound check, he'd always have a new song. He was always trying, I think it was a really golden period for him that. I think he kind of, he had a lot of support and he had a lot of, you know, all his ideas were going to get realised in, you know, in a, in a really good manner, you know. I mean, you know, to put the master plan on a B-side, ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, when I first heard that, I was like, that's just, you know, it's a cl another classic song. It's not the master plan. Those B-sides, you know, things like Step Up, things like The Master Plan and Acquiesce that were all generated around the time this album was recorded, any of those would have more than earned their place on the album. I mean, he really, he was absolutely on a roll as a songwriter at this point, and I think a big part of that, uh, I, I think when that happens, it's usually driven by two things. One is um, staggering confidence of just thinking, I've done it, I got away with it, everybody loves my band, I can do anything. And I think the other thing as well was possibly a feeling of thinking, how long is this going to last? Because this is, this is the other great terror that lurks inside anybody who does actually crack it, is, is this all going to be over this time next year? We'd better cash in while we can. And I think he was, I think he had no compunction at the time about thinking, let's just bash this stuff out now, let's get it all out there. There may not be any point, if I've got another great song, there may not be any point in saving it for the third album. As it turned out, of course, everybody ended up with rather good reason to wish he had saved a few more of these songs for the third album. The album drifts back into familiarity with the seventh track. Some might say it was the first single to be released from the record and also marked Oasis's first UK number one. I think it's a great song, and the reason it's a great song is the harmonies. That when um, Nolan and Liam harmonise on that, I, I don't know, it's just, it just does something. It sends a chill up your spine. I mean, it's, I think it's great, great bit of, again, like very underrated, overlooked sort of bit of what made them great musically was those two kind of voices sort of blending together, um, which they seem to do really kind of effortlessly. As you know, the first we, the first song we heard from the record, it kind of introduced that um, you know mid-tempo Oasis sound. It, it kind of sums up the Oasis sound they've stuck with now for many years. Um, but on first listen, it did seem slightly different. It sounded slightly bigger than um, than the, the stuff off of uh, Def Definitely Maybe. Um, kind of a bit less a bit less cool, to be honest. I thought um, a bit more sort of uh, standard British rock. Um, but you know, it, it was a, it was a good tune, and um, it kind of it, you know it, it set standards. I mean, I, I tend to find that before each of the the singles that the band have released before each of their albums have kind of set the standard of how good that record's going to be. So you've got um, you know, Supersonic, fantastic record, pre pre cooling, um, uh, definitely maybe a fantastic record. Some might say a, a pretty good s single coming out before Def um, What's the Story you know, a pretty good record. Um, and then it was like, do you know what I mean? The dullest record on earth um, coming out before Be, Be Here Now. I mean, and that, that, by that point, once, once Do You Know What I Mean came out, you just knew that was it, it was all over, really. Um, they were never going to come out with another, um, you know, mind-blowing, mind-blowingly mind fresh sound. It's that thing of like, you know, when you're a songwriter, you look for hooks. You're looking for hooks and like, you know, your mo his mom probably said that to him. Well, well, you know, some might say that, you know. And, you know, it's like, it, it, it's, it's, it's per that's pop. It's like hooks are nothing. Hooks are like sort of, they're very hard to find, but they're there all the time. And some might say it's a perfect example of that. I think some might say it's brilliant, actually. I think that's a fantastic number one single. And that really was much more than Roll. Roll With It was, I think everyone knows that that was a throwaway. Um, 
almost a novelty, knees up, umpa, kind of playing to the sort of the idea that, that they were the uh, Britpop quo. Some might say was far cleverer than that, and that really, that really, um, yeah, that was that was a great moment actually. That being massive gave everybody a thrill. That was that was fun. That was really fantastic. In the nineties, we started to enter a period where the, the charts getting less and less important. But Oasis records still were really put. They did feel like events when they came out. I don't know whether in the whole world, the whole of the UK was a massive event. But it felt like an event, definitely in the music scene, mm -hmm. and definitely around Manchester. There was a definitely, there's a feeling of excitement. And there's also, you would look at the charts and you're kind of hoping you get to number one. I don't know why. Why should I care if you get to number one? It's not like I'm getting any money out of it. But it's, it's, it's a kind of feeling of pride. You think, eh, go on, Noel, it's great, you know. In, in, in the mid-90s, the charts were possibly just at the top of the decline that they have spiralled into since. I mean, the, 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 for example, the battle for number one between Blur and Oasis was the last time I can recall anybody really caring. I could make a record sell 30 copies, I'd be number one next week. It's ridiculous now, you know. Well, it's great when you're number one, isn't it? That would be, that would be demeaning to all the bands who've never had one, you know what I mean? It's easy when, it's easy when you, you know, when you're... When you're really cool and you know an underground band to say oh it doesn't matter but it does if you're going to be in the charts you might as well be top you know there's nothing more annoying than being number two in the charts believe you me yeah at, at the time yeah it seemed like a big deal that oasis had a number one but really pretty much now anybody with competent distribution a large family and you know the sort of willingness to put the hours in to organise it can have at least a top 40 hit. It's not difficult anymore and it doesn't really matter. While some might say it was a bombastic assault on the ears, the next track on Morning Glory, Cast No Shadow, marked a return to more ballad-driven territory. Actually, for me, Cast No Shadow is a better song than Wonderwall. It's, it's, it's a really, really great song, isn't it? It's, I think a lot, a lot of people really recognise it's been a really great song. Again, it shows there's more size to Oasis than people think. You know, it's not, it's not a completely yobbish, dumb band. Or just, it's all about swagger and rock and roll, and we're getting to the top, and isn't it great? Manchester, hey. There's actually, like, um, another side to them, you know, sitting there with the acoustic guitar, looking at the floor, feeling a, feeling a bit down, you know? And, and they capture that really perfectly in Cast No Shadow. Again, another dimension to it. I mean, what, what, what do you write about if you're a band? Do you, you write about, well, you know, what you did before you were in a band and then what you write about um, girls and relationships or whatever. And then it's kind of what other sort of stuff do you write about? And I think I was writing about a kind of close friend, you know, who, who they kind of really admired. And, or, or it certainly seems, it seems that, that way. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's nice. It just adds another kind of twist um, to the album. It's just, I think, one of the four songs, one of the four or five songs in that album that really give it its, its mood and, you know, the, the sense of longing almost for the life that Noel Gallagher was leading before he became a rock and roll superstar, which was weird, because that's all he ever wanted. I think maybe Cast No Shadow doesn't get the, the recognition it deserves, but you know, it gets much more recognition than a lot of amazing songs by other bands. Cast No Shadow, uh, I think, yeah, Liam rather braze it rather than sings it. Um, it's dedicated on the sleeve notes to the genius of Richard Ashcroft, which I would have called a fairly debatable proposition myself, but that's a nice idea for a song. It's a generous tribute, although Noel Gallagher's lyrics being as, as you know, vague and non-specific as they are, it really could just as easily be about you know, Diego Maradona or Leon Trotsky or nobody or nothing at all, really. This dedication was an uncharacteristic nod towards one of their peers. Richard Ashcroft, a long-time friend of the Gallagher's, was lead singer of fellow Northern collective The Verve, who, until they imploded in 1998, was seen by many as being all set to enjoy the same level of success as Oasis. See, Verve actually go back to the Stone Roses. They come from that tradition. That's the model, isn't it? They were, you know, Stone Roses did what they had to do and left, and maybe Verve think in those kind of terms, whereas Oasis will bludgeon on, you know, is they're, they're, they're a band that don't make their art statements and go. I mean, Oasis is about keeping them going. It's not a job. It's not something I could just say, well, I, well I, in fact, I don't want to be in a band anymore, you know. 
I can't not, because I, you know, this is my life. This is what I do. It's what I was doing 10 years before you even knew who I was. I, I don't think the Verve uh, were ever in any meaningful danger of becoming anything like as big as Oasis. I think, I think they were, to a colossal extent, a massive confidence trick who got incredibly lucky on one song, the good bits of it which weren't theirs. No change, I can change, I can change. Beyond that, I think there was very, very little holding the Verve edifice up. Um, and as I think, well, as I think has certainly been borne out by um, Richard Ashcroft's solo works, the lyrics of which, I have to say, make Noel Gallagher read like T.S. Eliot. Yet another change in direction is evident in the next track, the light-hearted and often derided She's Electric. She's electric. She's in a family full of eccentrics. She's done things I've never expected. It seemed, even though this was only the second album, that every Oasis album was going to have a comedy moment on it. And on the first album, it was Diggsy's Dinner. Um, and on the second album, it was She's Electric. And I think She's Electric it has quite a jolting effect. It, it, it really has a jarring uh, relationship with these sort of the quite beautiful, downbeat, mournful ballads that comprise most of the album. And it's like uh, someone doing, you know, um, knees up Mother Brown in the middle of a funeral. I like throwaway songs. I, I think it's, it's great you get a wacky song on. Oh, the Beatles always did it, Yellow Submarine, which, which I've always really loved, but maybe it's because I remember when I was a kid and we used to, when I was seven, it's the first pop song I ever really got into was Yellow Submarine. And you listen to it now years later and you think, oh, it's actually quite psychedelic. It's quite, quite a weird song, isn't it? You can listen to it as a kid's song. It's great. It works as a kid's song. It's like a nursery rhyme. And a lot of great pop music got is nursery rhymes. Lyrically, I think Noel Gallagher did get rumbled for having nicked quite a lot of it from the theme to the schools programme. The whole, there's sort of lots and lots for us to see, which, I mean, it, 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 does, it does sound like something somebody wearing a clown suit should be singing to an audience of sort of bewildered five-year-olds. No, I mean, Noah's lyrics are, are kind of really interesting because some of it is kind of doggerel. It's kind of what, if you're, you've had a couple of bottles of red wine, you, you might kind of blurt out with things that rhyme. And then you could kind of justify it by saying it's, it's psychedelic, it's weird, it's a, it's a stream of consciousness sort of mishmash of, of, of ideas. Sort of starts off with the music and then it'll change halfway through by writing the melody over. The, the words always come last, but the melody and, and the, the actual chords on the guitar come first. Noel's never been that, um, he's never been known for his uh, Wildean uh, ironies in his lyrics, has he? I mean, he's no Morrissey, let's face it. Um, and I, I kind of think there's a bit of a charm to, to the, the nonsense lyrics. Um, um, certainly, it, when Supersonic came out and you know, I was sort of dancing around the indie discos to it, it seemed, you know, a little bit sort of magical and dangerous. You know, sniffing stuff through a cane on a supersonic train is just like, what do you mean? You know, it sounds like, wow, what drugs is this fella on? Um, but once you get to the, the um, trite stuff like rhyming sister with blister, I mean, that's just like, obviously five o'clock in the morning <laughs> sister blister brilliant yeah that'll do you know when we when we're recording this 10 minutes right okay i think his lyrics are you know okay on it you know i think there's far worse things later on down the line i mean where he's obviously kind of struggling for things to write about because he wakes up and he just sees an acre of garden and a swimming pool and a, some beautiful trees and a football pitch you know the pitch would rhyme with ditch pool would rhyme with fool Trees would rhyme with knees or bees, and the house would belong to a very tiny mouse. <laughs> Possibly this was why, you know, famously after his election in 1997, Tony Blair perceived a certain kindred spirit in Noel Gallagher. I mean, both of them were very good at sort of writing things that when you heard them in context, you know, or saw them perform, just sounded amazing. And then when you actually read them written down on paper, you just thought, what the hell is this all about? Um, and plus, of course, some might say does mention education. There are seven people in this room tonight who are giving a little bit of hope 
to young people in this country. That is me, our kid, Bonehead, Quigsy, Alan White, Alan McGee and Tony Blair. And if you've all got anything about you, you get up there and you shake Tony Blair's hand, man. He's a man. Power to the people! While She's Electric was heavily reliant on humour and irony, the next song, title track Morning Glory, saw the music and lyrics taking a much darker turn. All your dreams are made When you change to the mirror and a razor blade Today's the day that all the world will see I think that's a really exciting um, rock and roll song that's almost worthy of, you know, the Stones or the Stooges. You know, like, I can think of no higher compliment. I think that's brilliant. And that's where Noel Gallagher's, um, you know, hazy, mixed-up images somehow seems to work. The title track is Oasis sort of, I think, uh, staking their claim on, yes, we are, you know, rock and roll colossi, look upon our works, ye mighty in despair. Morning Glory is, is uh, uh, the one I love by R.E.M. Um, and, the, you know, numerous other little steals from lots of other different things. <laughs> elements of the one I love by OEM in it but um, the one I love has got a great tune and this one is just like it's just there's just there's done nothing to it really I mean it's it, it, it kind of just rockets along and then stops and it's so long it's like five minutes long or something stupid I mean you know there's, there's not enough song to fill it um, so yeah so it does it is just it's the, it's the noise and it's them sort of you know it's taking the the, the noise element to its extreme and and Fairly pointlessly, I think. I think that's one of the low points of the record. It's actually my least favourite track on the album because I never been that bothered about REM. And it, yeah, it's good, but it's not. Um, it, does, it's, it doesn't sound. It doesn't have the comfort of that tradition of great stomping anthems or very introspective kind of Britishness, which the rest of the album is very good at. The more Americanized sound of Morning Glory meant that the song was released as a single for the U.S. market, part of the band's much vaunted attempt to become equally as huge on the other side of the Atlantic. I don't know if, um, if Oasis could ever have made it in America. I mean, think about um, British bands that have made it in America in the last 20 years, Radiohead and Coldplay and the Cranberries. I don't know if Americans would ever have taken to bolshy British boot boys, working class, you know, they've got their own working class um, poets, if you like, they've got their um, Bruce Springsteen's and their John Cougar Mellencamp's that speak about what it's like to live in America's heartland and work in factories and dream of escape. Oasis are the British version of that. I don't think the Americans ever really got Oasis and that's, um, and that's because they saw them as a rock band and um, they're more than a rock band, really. Um, it's like, it's like if the Beatles came along, you know, today, would they break America? And it's like, well, they probably wouldn't. I don't know if it's, it's so kind of segregated musically uh, and rock stations playing sort of rock music. Um, I, I don't think they could have released the same kind of singles that they released in Britain. They want bands to be a bit humble and, you know, they know how big they are in America and, and you know, you can't just go over and, and be snotty and, and, and take the place. I mean, you know, it, it, I don't know if it's ever worked for anybody. I'll tell you what, man, I've never seen a band try so hard to break America. I mean, they work their asses off. You know, most English bands go to America, they go New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, home. Races went New York, that being between, that being in between, that being there, down to Texas. I mean, they really... You know, they really hammered it in America. 
Um, I think it was very important for them to to compete with all the other American bands. And they, they really kind of went at it, hammer and tongs, you know. I, I went on tour with them around America, and it was, you know, 2,000 seaters in, you know, Baxwareville, Nowheresville, you know, that place, you know. Live 105, hello? Hello, I got something to say to Oasis. Hey! 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 Hello? <laughs> you guys are playing in like a 21 and over club? Yeah, we are. We're playing at Midland Club in Old St. Cagaf. No, no, I'm 18. <laughs> You're bastards, you know? Oh, the 21 club, yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't fault. see you. Uh, you want to ring, what's he called, President? Clinton. See, that's the myth about Oasis, isn't it? Oh, yeah, Oasis, they never made it in America. But they had a top ten album. This is a top ten album and a top five single. In the period, hardly any British bands ever get a top ten album, you know. And even now, years later, they still sell out the Madison Square Gardens in 17 minutes, was it, or something like amazing? You know, that's not bad, is it? I mean, most British bands go there, they can't sell out CBGBs in 17 minutes. Morning Glory, as with many Oasis songs, also featured references to drugs culture a frank honesty about their bad boy image that caused the band no small amount of controversy. No one was always a party animal. Even when he came to us at the beginning, it was like, he liked to party, you know what I mean? He was always off to raves at the weekend and all that. He used to have raves in fields in those days and he was always off to these things. Um, and, and as the Inspirals became more and more successful and as Noel's wage became bigger and bigger, yeah, he used to indulge himself in a few of his favourite things. You know, in the 80s, uh, drugs, few people took drugs, didn't they? It wasn't like mainstream. Acid House comes along, a lot of people get to ecstasy, and suddenly drugs are everywhere, you know? There's people taking drugs all over the city centre, you think, God, these people are actually all on drugs. It was, you know, when I was a kid, there's only a few people who took drugs. It was something that kind of mad people who, like, chemists would be into drugs, you know, or, you know, and, and a couple of freaks at school would take drugs. But then suddenly, I'm sure if I went back to school I went to now, there'd be, there'd be five people who didn't take drugs and everyone else would. If you like a rock and roll band, you want to know that they've trashed a hotel room, don't you? You don't want to know that they go home and have yoghurt. You want to think that they're living this life. That's why you buy their records, so you can live the, your fantasies through them. You want them to be debauched and deranged and dangerous. You know, that's what you want. You don't want your rock and roll stars doing yoga and thinking about calling the kids Apple or something like that. You want them to be having a good time. That sort of got away from the music. When I went to see them at Glastonbury in 94, I think it was 94, they argued on stage and it was just like, that's not what you want to hear at Glastonbury. Some, a couple of blokes having an argument. It was, you know, it's Glastonbury. And so um, that was quite difficult. I just wanted to play the music and just let everyone, you know, immerse themselves in the music, really. Let's talk about music. Let's not talk about you being an arse guy. Let's talk about music. Let's talk about music. Let's not talk about being an arse man. Let's talk about music. You're getting about a situation that occurred on a boat. Yeah, there must be truth behind every story you read about. I mean, if Liam's, you know, lost some teeth in Germany, there's a reason why, and it? It's because Liam's Liam and he probably wound somebody up, you know what I mean? But sometimes the press reporting is, um, I don't know, it overshadows the music, doesn't it? Definitely. I think it's sad that that happens, but that's the way it is. That's the nature of the beast, isn't it? If, you, <clears throat> if you're a rock and roll band that are into the excesses of rock and roll, the tabloids are going to concentrate on the ex excesses rather than the uh, rock and roll, so that's the way it goes. As well as overshadowing the music, the headline-grabbing antics of the Gallagher brothers also meant that the other members of the band, Paul McGuigan, Alan White and Paul Bonehead Arthurs, were often overlooked entirely. Basically, Oasis was Quigsy, Quigsy and Bonehead started it, and then they got Liam and then Noel joined later. And it was those four, really, and, you know, their, their positions in it. You know, Grigsy was always the, um, he was the Henry Kissinger of the band. You know, the eruptions would, you know, would, would erupt. And the next day it would be Grigsy, come on, Noel, let's go and have a drink, you know, and, you know, soothing the situation and calming the troubled waters. And, you know, I've seen him do it loads of times, you know. Me and Grigsby did a book about a footballer called Robin Friday and we got interviewed by Hunter Davis who wrote the authorised biography of the Beatles and a great book about Tottenham Hotspur called The Glory Game. And Grigsby said to him, he said, I'm the luckiest guy alive. He said, I'm not a great bass player, you know. What I do functions in this group, you know. And Bonehead the same, you know. They were certainly overshadowed by the, by the, uh, the, person the other personas in the band. But as we've seen, those personas have carried that band through for 10 years after their creative peak um, and they're still selling a lot of records and the people are still interested in them. Um, so perhaps the personas are actually more important than the music. 
After Morning Glory's sonic blast of excess, the album finishes on a more contemplative and somewhat epic note. Champagne Supernova was a psychedelic journey that, ten years on, still remains a firmly rooted fan favourite. It's incredibly full of itself. It's, it's incredibly portentous and bombastic, and it works. Um, it just, I mean, it's, you know, they, they really bet the farm on this one. It has the kind of sort of slightly strange and silly downpour sound effect introducing it. Um, it builds and it builds and it builds. They sort of rope Paul Weller in to contribute backing vocals and lead guitar, and it's, it's Noel Gallagher, I think, sort of trying to reimagine Stairway to Heaven as, as played by Slade. I think Champagne Supernova was the right tone at the time, because, I mean, what we had on the first record, um, the, the equivalent, I guess, would be Cigarettes and Alcohol, which was a big, great rock song about our lives. You know, it's what we did at weekends, brilliant. You know, we all did it. Cigarettes and Alcohol, fantastic. And to know that they were still living that sort of hedonistic lifestyle with the, despite all the success, Champagne Supernova kind of encapsulates that. It touched on, you know, sort of Oasis itself as this kind of supernova light that kind of flashed everywhere for three years, dropping champagne and cocaine wherever they went, you know, it had that kind of massive element to it. So I think it's a great, it's a great closing statement. You know, Liam singing on that is really good as well. I really like his voice on that. I think he's, uh, I think he's really good on that. It was Noel Gallagher saying, I can, I can string any words together and it will seem like the most profound, insightful comment on the human condition known to mankind. And that's, I mean, it really is, it's just preposterous. Slowly walking down the hall, faster than a cannonball, is the worst line in probably in British lyric history, certainly of the last 20 years. How can you just slowly, slowly walk down a hall and yet still be faster than a cannonball? I mean, is the cannonball like rolling slowly? Has it got legs? Is it crawling? What? What does that mean? What are you on about? I think that unless you've taken drugs, you aren't going to understand that. This is what I've heard anyway, because obviously I don't do drugs, but slowly walking down the hall faster than a cannonball is such a great drug lyric, because that's exactly what happens, you know. You can imagine Noel writing it after a, a really frazzled night um, in a toilet cubicle somewhere. It says a hell of a lot about where Oasis were at that year and that, at that point in their career. Although popular, Champagne Supernova also drew accusations of self-indulgence, a mindset which would plague Oasis on their follow-up album, Be Here Now, widely seen as the great folly of the Britpop era. Be Here Now, certainly when stacked up against the first two albums, it sounded incredibly lifeless, uh, dreary, pompous, full of itself, humourless, and um, yeah, just, you know, in again, in the context of what had come before, one of the great dufferoos in, in, in modern rock and roll history. Oasis fans at last got their hands on the group's new album, Be Here Now. It's their first for two years. Why don't you like the album? It's just the same old stuff. It's like, you know, guitar rock, dad rock, all the same. I speak to an old, like, like, uh, saw him, last time I saw him, I was just saying to him, uh, Be Here Now is... Uh, well, it's not that good, is it, Noel? It's got, it's, there's a few problems there. And I mean, the songs, I actually like the songs. A lot of the songs are really good, in it? But, God, they go on. They're about eight minutes long. And he was going, yeah, but there's cocaine everywhere. Ever telling him I'm, I'm a genius. And I'm just going, that guitar sounds great. I'll put another guitar on or another guitar on. And no one's telling him to say, stop. There's too many guitars on here. Once you hit Be Here Now, you realise that, that as far as the records go, they were, they were getting worse one by one. And I think they went one worse with the following one, Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. But I think since then they've done a couple of records that have kind of upped the game a bit. Um, 
you, you can always, they're reliable now. Oasis albums are kind of reliable. There'll be one good ballad, there'll be two or three good pop, good rock songs on it. Um, the rest of be sort of Oasis sounding filler. I mean, you know that it's going to sound like Oasis every single record. I still like what they do. I still everything they bring out still excites me in some way. In Due Times is a great record, you know. I still I still play that, and I still find the music very exciting. And I always look forward to what they're doing, you know. And they don't. I don't think they. They're sort of never going to. I don't think they're ever going to surprise us with going in a different direction musically. But they don't need to really, do they? You know what I mean? It's like. Ein's tomato soup is Ein's tomato soup. We don't want it to change, do we? You know what I mean? And I think we all want Oasis to carry on being a bit like how they've been since the start, really. I don't think you'll see. Um, I don't think you'll see much of us in the in the near future for one reason or another. But we've got to sit down and want, um, see where we're going musically. There's a lot of things to sort out, you know. They've had everything levelled at them. Everything, negativity, positivity, all sorts. It doesn't matter. They are a a, a, a business. 10 or 15 years' time, I hope they find the music, I hope they find what they're on about, really, you know. And I hope they start speaking, because they, they have a lot of influence over a lot of people. And I hope they start writing songs that mean something, that can get something changing, you know. And so Britain can become what we think it should be, rather than what the politicians think. Despite the arguable quality of their work since, Nothing can take away the fact that, with morning glory, Oasis achieved what most bands can only dream of, defining a decade, selling countless million albums and reintroducing rock and roll to a whole new generation. Definitely made it was such a statement, but I still think Whilst the Story is their best album, um, in the same way that everyone buys Sgt Pepper, but you know, Revolve is a better album. If you want to know about 95 and 96, and if you're going to investigate Oasis, you have to have that album. Simple as that.